Okay, that was a long break. It was a long break, and I see some people still mingling and networking and having their conversations. So welcome back, and thank you for coming back. Um, the next guest speaker we have is Dr. Björn Bringmann. He's um, with partner with Deloitte and managing director of the AI Institute at Deloitte. He is also a PhD in computer science and over 20 years of experience in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So this will be the business perspective on AI and of uh, our situation at the moment. And I'm pretty sure Bjorn joined me on stage. Pretty sure that Bjorn will share some use cases and implementation cases here with us. His speech is called Race to AI, a Global Perspective. Thanks for joining us, Bjorn. Wonderful. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, title. I looked at the conference and thought uh, AI is obviously something we all care about. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And uh, this is ra rise of AI. And doesn't it nicely fit to have the race topic in here as well? And it just goes so well with rise to AI and race to AI. Um, and I wanted to give a little bit of a global perspective, but not only, um, with some local implications. Because if you have a race, you're typically not alone. Uh, which means globally uh, doesn't really work. We have some sections, so to speak, globally that we want to have a closer look at. Um, and you have seen them before, so I will mostly, I think, um, augment what we had before. Uh, I don't really believe that there are many contradictions, but let's see. So race to AI, another analogy that comes to mind, and I think that plays very well here, is about, what's that, 70 years ago, six years ago, there was a race to the moon. Um, that was basically kick-started by the US, and this one doesn't really feel too different when you dive into it. You heard this morning a lot about what implications AI will have on society, right? Um, and these are all good and relevant. If this didn't wake you up, or if you're still slightly asleep from lunch, which by the way was great, so thank you whoever selected this, um, there are 12, 12 trillion dollar at stake annually. Just to put this into perspective, um, the GDP from Germany is 4 trillion annually. So this is globally, but it's also three times as high. So this is uh, uh, quite, quite some money, um, and that's something uh, we are all looking to benefit from. So what does it mean, 12 trillion dollars? Obviously, this is not just in one niche, right? This is something that's literally all over the place. So this will happen in automotive, in banking, in anything you can think of, plus the things that aren't invented yet. Um, at least to say, uh, impacts on, on social so, and society. Now, it's usually called a general purpose technology by now, which is an amazing term. It basically says it's a technology that at the beginning nobody really knows what to do with, and then it suddenly is everywhere, right? Such as the steam engine or robots or information technology, so all the computers you have, um, electricity is missing here. And they tend to have quite some impact, right? These are small numbers, but if you scale them over everything we have, 0.3% is a lot. And that was a steam engine. And I think you can imagine steam engine, kind of one of the first engines, had really a lot of impact because it basically liberated us partially from manual labor. If you look at the power for AI, you can see that it's four times as long, right? So there's a lot more going to happen than when comparing to the steam engine. And another thing, that often happens is really this AI will be there somewhere in the future. And I have the feeling I'm preaching to the choir here, um, because I guess we agree that that future is already here. There's a nice amendment here which says it's just not evenly distributed. Right? We don't have the same AI capabilities and also progress and move and intention behind it globally. So if we look at the uh, different players in this room, then you s oh, sorry. Um, Europe, right? Um, so then you see three different players that are usually talked about. Usually. Uh, quite many talk about only the two on the left and on the right. Um, 
quite some, though, uh, to my surprise, positive surprise, say, and we've heard this this morning, and I'm part of that team, is that Europe is not just relevant, but also still has a really good chance to be part of that race, or as I prefer to call it, have a seat at the table. Why would we care? I think, again, we've heard this uh, this morning from, from Hans and Chris and, and many of the others, because um, this is not just about making something more efficient, right? This will profoundly change how things are done today, and hence it will also pick up some of the parts in the, from the society where it's developed in. And I might be biased, but I do really appreciate human, uh, um, human values as well, that's true, but European values, right? So I would highly appreciate uh, to be part of the game. Um, a question that occurred to me is like, race, wonderful. Ah, wrong button. Um, when did that actually start? And it seems mostly that, you know, nothing much happened. You know, there was a lot of AI research and, you know, all know the story from uh, 1956 uh, where it kind of started as a small group and, you know, it went on and things happened in the background. Um, then somewhere there I did my PhD, nothing really happened. Um, and then in 2016 or 2015 rather, two things happened roughly at the same time. One was that AlphaGo, that probably nobody of us played against but all heard about, uh, won against Lee Sedol in Go, a game that everybody thought a computer can never actually play very well. Um, and uh, the Obama administration also kicked off quite some work in the direction of artificial intelligence, which was, as it's called, a Sputnik moment for China, because they saw things happening with the game of Go, probably also quite impressed that uh, this technology is able to do things that were not just unexpected, but really pushed far, far away, and basically jumped on the, ri uh, on the race, or started the race, in fact, and um, Hans, I think, put it very nicely, they have a strategy where AI is basically always on top. Um, that's roughly how it looked like when the race started out. Let's go a little bit more into detail into how that looks like. Before, there's another question maybe, where are we racing to, right? And I stole that from Chris, who presented that uh, a while ago, actually right here, and I think it just brings it really to the point. Um, these three different regions are not completely um, exclusive, obviously, right? But they have a slightly different goal or intention of where they're going to. And if you want to put it down to one word, in the US it's mostly about efficiency, right? Um, pure capitalism, if, if you like. Um, in China, it's mostly about social cohesion, right? You really want to have all as one, if you like. And in Europe, we have that thing called humanism, right? Um, so we really, really care about the people, which, by the way, is a very nice export model. People like Europe and come here and don't go to so many other places if they have to leave their home country because here it's about the people. Um, so it's not just us liking our values. So that's where we're racing to. Still, we're all on the same road at the moment, and there's this wonderful quote that comes in. Um, Once a new technology rolls over you, if you're not part of the steamroller, you're part of the road. And I really like to sit in the steamroller, right? And I'm pretty sure uh, I'm not the only one. And this one really looks like it's just powering up some steam. The details are promised. Not, not too many numbers, right? Just, just a uh, hunch here and there. Um, I looked at three different parts, more or less how you get some AI idea, uh, that's probably pre-idea still, into production or into the real world where it's producing value. Not, not saying that research is not part of the real world. Um, and if you look at those, and, and they came out as, as uh, three guys having uh, a strong left or a strong right, depending on which you look on, um, there's R&D spending uh, from the top 2,500 computer science information technology industries. And the blue one is actually the number of AI publications. Um, I think that's from last year or the year before. And you can see that the US is by far outspending everybody else, right? So this is, what, 10 times almost as much as, as in Europe, not Germany, right? So this is all Europe. Um, and Europe and China are roughly the same, if you really want to, on, on spending. The other thing is the right hand, if you like, um, number of publications. There, Europe is somewhere in the middle. Um, but there is some addition to make here that, that developed over the years. The US publications tend to be, uh, let's simply say, of a little bit more value, right? Like, however that is measured. Um, European publications 
usually were a little bit behind maybe and you know amount of value per publication if you like in China back when I did my PhD it was very much like you know you need a bunch of Chinese publications or Asian publications in fact to kind of come up with the same value that the publication from a US uh, Ivy League University would provide that's not really the case anymore they know what they're doing um, and so do obviously uh, the folks in the US and here so there it's a you could almost say level playing field, but the, the speed at which is changing is interesting here, which is um, there's a lot more happening in Asia than, than we ever expected. This is really good and interesting stuff, right? If you break it down a bit differently, uh, here we see the top 12, I believe, uh, companies with the highest R&D spending uh, two years ago, and you see, um, well, actually, let me highlight that. You see it's all tech, right? Everything that's now lit up is tech and you can see Europe is in there yay <laughs> um, we're not tech I mean obviously Volkswagen is building some technology right but not in that sense and um, Roche holding is uh, from Switzerland obviously and then we have Johnson Johnson which is US again um, but not tech and somewhere up there UI is Chinese and Samsung is obviously from Korea South Korea what's interesting here is two things if you would have looked at this chart seven, eight years ago, so 2014, then Volkswagen was at the top with pretty much exactly the same amount of money they spend now. And if you look at the top two, Amazon and Alphabet here, they doubled their spending complete, uh, compared to the year before. So there's a lot of money going into AI research here. If we go one step further, we're coming into innovation, right? So how do all these ideas get into reality? And that's usually why are startups. Um, and that's a, a very simple comparison. I think the, the one that sticks out is obviously in the middle. This is basically just a percentage of how many startups are in which region. And you can see that the US has, I think that's about 65% of the total number of startups in those three regions. Europe comes in as a second, not a close second. Um, that's I think somewhere about 20, 22%, and then um, China is there with 12%. If you put the, others number, the other numbers uh, together with this, then it becomes more interesting. So the number of unicorns, by the way, this, this numbers changed while I made the talk. So if you double check, you will get slightly different numbers. Um, but the differences probably won't change. So around about 600 unicorns, so 1 billion or more valued startups in the US, almost 200 in China and around about 80 in Europe. And the amount of funding, so there the US obviously wins, if you like, and the amount of funding that goes into those startups, China by far outstrips the other two. And that I thought was really impressive, right? So that being said, many things going on, and Europe is, well, not really a front runner. It's kind of hard to say that we're in the middle even, right? Um, but we're on there. Um, the last one on this part is really capturing value. Like at some point, whatever idea you have has to kind of generate some kind of value. And we did um, a study uh, at Deloitte last year where we asked close to 3,000 executives around the world in 12 countries, um, which is the state of AI in the enterprise. And this is just one of the many charts in there. Um, we classified all the companies that replied. By the way, it was a double-blind survey, so nobody knows whom we asked, and those didn't know that we were asking, so as good as it gets. Um, we classified all the companies into four different types, right? which is not really linear, but uh, for the stack bar chart, that wouldn't work otherwise. You have starters. That's very simple. They don't really do a lot yet, and they haven't really achieved a lot yet, right? Fair enough, so those are starters. On the other hand, on the top, the green ones, uh, that's what we call transformers. Um, they're doing a lot, and they're generating a lot of output with this. And then you have the two blue ones in the middle, the achievers, the unfortunate ones. They really do a lot, or try a lot, I, I guess I have to say, but it doesn't really work, or at least they are not there yet. And then you have the path seekers that don't do so much, but it all works. And since we're at the blue ones, um, let's just highlight two parts. If you look at the light blue one in Germany, that's the underachievers. We are really good at underachieving. Um, Europe is 
just about on the same level. Europe, in this case, is France, UK, Italy, and Germany, right? Um, so overall, Europe might be slightly worse at underachieving, uh, so to speak, but on average, it, you know, it's kind of the same size. The other blue bar, which is really uh, in your face, if I may say so, is China. Many that try and succeed, right? They haven't done everything yet, but basically the dark blue ones are the ones that move into the green bar. So if you go two years ahead, uh, you will see that that green bar in China will have grown massively, unless things go wrong. And the final piece, uh, which I think is interesting here, is if you look at the green bars only, we're not really that bad either. So we do have companies that do things and are successful with it. So somebody out there is doing something right. Since it's double blind, I can't tell you whom, but they shouldn't be so hard to find, right? I think we kind of know them. Um, so there, it, it does work. There are examples to copy, but we need to move. So what are we waiting for? That's pretty much how the race looks like right now. You can go on and read indices after indices on AI and talent and whatnot, but at the end of the day, it's always, we started roughly at the same spot. Uh, the US was ahead. China triggered the race, so to speak, um, and now it's pretty much um, a, a speed car in red, uh, the US constantly moving forward, and Europe sitting there wondering what they should do. Um, so wh what are we waiting for? And I think we heard uh, similar ideas um, throughout the day, but when you look at this race, um, something comes to mind uh, from through the looking glass, which is really, um, it will take all the running that we can do to just stay where we are. But if we want to advance, we need to do a little more, right? And this is, um, it may sound painful, but to be honest, working in AI is quite fun. So it doesn't have to be. Is it fear that we have in Europe, maybe especially in Germany, um, that keeps us from being more successful, right? And there are typically two things, right? And um, one is, there are risks, and on the other side, there are opportunities. So things when you do something that will go wrong, and things when you do something that will go right, which in AI is really risks mostly we've heard of this morning. Can it be over or misused as a risk? And on the other side, opportunities, you know, how can you properly use it to generate some value, ethics, and everything included? Um, and since we're apparently all really good at being afraid of stuff here, I thought I'd put up a third risk, which I don't hear too many people talk about. There's an opportunity cost, which is if we just stay in place, we're going to lose something, right? Um, more prominent at the moment, I believe, is, is climate change on this. There, we have numbers now that say, if we don't do something, uh, we will use, what was it, about a 200 trillion US dollar over the next, I don't know, 30 years, right? It's expensive to just sit and wait. It's really expensive. And the sitting and waiting here seems to come out there in, in two different forms. One is really people, like the general population seems to be afraid of it for AI taking over the world, um, AI taking over their jobs. Part of our survey was on the jobs. And um, to be honest, it, it, no, no company really wants to replace any human, right? Because we have, and in Germany quite dramatically so, a demographic shift coming up will be pressed to actually find people for the jobs that we do still have, and the rest, ideally, we need to automate to stay up to our level of uh, wealth and, and comfort that we have here. Um, then there's the other one uh, that, that I see quite frequently, which is um, in the industries, in the companies. They really want to be innovative. They really want to do something new. But they also really want you to show that it has worked at their competitor two years ago already which is not how I thought innovation was defined. I thought innovation was defined as, let's do something and take the risk of this going wrong, right? But let's do this often enough because we know things can work. And again, we've seen it before, there are companies who do this very successfully, also in Europe, so this can be done. So I reformulated, I mean, you may have seen it uh, while I was talking here, um, maybe we shouldn't really fear AI. I'm not saying we should all just, you know, go and do whatever, there are many things that can go wrong, but maybe it's more about respect, right, of what this technology can do, and uh, obviously handle the, the bad things, but don't ignore the opportunity cost because that's massive. And that's not just massive in terms of us selling less money, 
but about uh, the different systems in the world becoming more or less powerful. And again, I like my European values. So if we're all fearing it, then one thing to at least on the population side, but also on the, on the industry side is really uh, that we probably need to do something that we can trust those systems because they're honestly uh, not so easy to understand as a knife maybe would be, right? Where we all agree that a knife, you can hurt yourself, but you don't have to if you use it properly. Um, mitigating risk with a knife is easy. Mitigating risk with AI up till now is maybe not that easy yet. Um, and there was a huge discussion and, and a huge uh, publication series, I can say, I guess, um, from the European Union on all topics trust with AI. And actually, uh, obviously, as we as Deloitte are trying to move the economy and, and the society forward here as well, um, we took this by heart and, and worked quite a bit on it and came up with these six different areas, actually, what needs to be considered if you want to build an AI system that's actually trustworthy, right? That you don't need to be afraid of, that you can use, that you know what it's doing, and so on and so forth. So bias, ethics, all in there. Um, if you want to know more about this, just at the corner uh, is my colleague who's basically uh, working on this quite a bit. And I think this is really one part of the game, how to move things forward, really make people understand that this is nothing to be afraid of. Another part uh, that would tremendously help is if we would move forward with our digital single market in Europe. Because if you want to scale in the US, you have one huge, roughly uh, homogeneous economy that you can work in. China, pretty much the same. Europe, not so much. There you can see the little black lines are borders, right? Um, going through one of those is not that trivial yet. So moving forward and making it easier in Europe to scale will certainly be part of the puzzle, I believe. Um, Good news here, I guess, is um, you could say once you can make it here, you can make it anywhere because once you cross one of those borders, any other border wouldn't really be a problem anymore, right? Um, so this is a good training ground, uh, but we can probably make it easier and we, we have to, to su succeed here because certainly none of the countries you can see there will be able to succeed with AI alone. Another one is, um, and that's the ugliest slide I made, I'm afraid, there needs to be more funding for research and innovation. I've heard a lot of discussions that the industry needs to come in and the industry says the government has to come in. But if you look at the big things that happened in the past, be it the internet or the global positioning system that everybody uses all the time now, electric vehicles being, well, they're not really around the corner anymore, they're right here, right there. Or mRNA, which you know most of us uh, got a little injection with uh, recently, they were all heavily government funded because they were simply it was simply not clear enough how to use them from the industry, right? Certainly not by one player. So there, there we need a little bit more cash, I guess. And just to compare, and I thought those numbers were interesting, um, the, the German government put six billion roughly on the table for investing in AI. Do you have any idea how much we paid for the airport in Berlin? Same number. Fair enough, 5.9 only, right? But if you look at what it brings, and I think the airport is probably great, um, could have been faster, uh, I think investing in AI is probably a little bit more pressing than the airport, right? Not tearing down the airport now that it stands, but if you compare those numbers, not so great. Um, then we have this Agentur für Sprung Innovation, which I believe has about a billion for the next five years, give or take. Harvard in the US has about two billion per year. So, yeah, a little bit more probably won't hurt. And another thing, um, again, I said this before, can't do this alone, and I also don't believe that one company can do this alone. And there's this famous example, obviously, of Silicon Valley, um, where, where there are many things happening at the same time, right? It probably started with Xerox Park years back, and then other industry uh, settled down there. You can go into a bar, and people from Facebook will talk to people from Google, and so on. Um, Many startups are there, there's ideas floating, money is floating, and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and these companies probably wouldn't have done it alone. So having an ecosystem sounds like a really, really great idea. And again, I think it's not just necessary, but also can be a lot of fun. And the different players we will need in there, are, you know, the ones mentioned before, we will need society in there. Um, we will need the industry in there because, quite frankly, they have the money and they, <laughs> they need the disruption. We need the research in there because, well, they know what they're doing, uh, simply speaking, and the government, because at the end of the day, um, that's all of us, right? 
and those being connected. And uh, here a little, um, little plug. Um, there's a summer fest from the KI Park on Friday, so if you don't have anything planned or put differently. If you have something planned, cancel that and go there. Um, that's a growing, one of the growing ecosystems here, and, and it's going to be great. One thing that I think is left is probably the most important and has been said before, but can't be said often enough. This is not going to work if people don't want it. I do fully understand that people are a little bit spooked, maybe, by AI. The first algorithm I built 20 years ago spooked me quite a bit. Um, but people don't have to be afraid of it because it's not really doing anything badly. We obviously have to be aware of it and respect it and make sure that nothing bad happens in the future. But right now, I think one of the most pressing things is really get people on board, enable them to understand what we have there, and enable them to use it and to push it. Because again, if the society doesn't want it, it's not going to happen. And it worked before. If you look at this picture, I think it's fascinating. Um, two guys, obviously kind of outdated fashion by now. Um, this was 1945, when 1954, sorry, when CERN was built. And CERN is the place to go if you're a physicist. Why wouldn't we have this for AI? Thank you. Thank you, Gun. We have some minutes left, and um, if you have some questions or also in the live stream, happy to, Bjorn will probably be happy to answer some of those. Any questions? Opposing opinions? We heard a lot about, again, about the spread between Europe, Asia, and US, and we have one question coming up here. André de Zucco Petri, uh, I only followed the last part of the presentation. The part on science or technology and society interested me the most, with a nice picture of smiling faces. How practically would you do it? And uh, could you give us some best practices? Which are the governments or the institutions who do it well, communicate with the society? Thank you. Yeah, very good question. So how to do that, how to excite people? Um, I think we've seen uh, one presentation earlier, which was about, is AI evil? Um, I think you get a little bit of the drift, you know, all the Terminators, Terminators in the movies uh, don't usually awaken a sense of, I want that. Uh, in, in people. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about how this worked in, in the Nordics. Um, what I'm aware of is uh, I think Helsinki has uh, set up a course for the public to, it, it's free, you know, you just sign up, you go on the internet as you do, um, sign up and you go through this training and it's tailored for non-tech people, it's tailored for the average, you know, Joe. Um, and um, they aimed at getting 1% through this. So 1% of the Finnish population uh, was the hope would take this course to really understand this a little bit better. They reached 2% by now. Now 2% doesn't really sound like a big number, but they overachieved by 100% what they had aimed for. And this course is now available, I think, in any language. So most simple thing, go there, sign up. Um, hmm. I think then after this, it probably should go a little bit broader into communication as a whole, right? So not just, you know, me saying sign up to that website, um, but really bring it into companies. That's what we see quite a bit, that in companies you obviously have the pushback, uh, do all kinds of fears. If you talk to people first what it is about, um, they will get excited. Maybe not all of them, right? Um, but you don't need 100%. If you get 99%, that's fair. Um, and again, I think if you if you educate people more, it doesn't have to be the super complicated technical stuff, right? Um, you don't need to know matrix multiplication to be not afraid of AI. Um, but you can bring this in, in schools, universities as a course. It doesn't have to be, you know, full-blown AI foundations course. So classical, to be honest. There might be better methods, but if we start with that, uh, it's not a bad start. Thank you. Another one, we have time for one more question. Thanks, Bryn, for the great perspective. And I especially want to like ask uh, again about this like opportunity cost and turn this a little bit around and say, what do you think does it take to make our large industrial corporations get a fear of missing out? Mm. Showing them the slide. Um, <laughs> I think they already do, right? They might just not be afraid of it enough. Uh, but if you look at the car industry, 
There's one automotive manufacturer that's basically a tech company and not an automotive company that's scaring people and they build a factory right around the corner. Um, Mr. Dees apparently has taken up the challenge and that's good, I think. They are also the ones being the only ones on the, on the R&D investments, right? How to turn them all around? I don't know. I do believe some will probably just disappear. Um, and if that's what's happening and it's not happening to all, that's probably fine. Um, and I think we've heard it this morning also from Chris who said, yes, the banks push back and say we have sensitive data, we're so over-regulated, but then Google again also has sensitive data and is quite regulated and they're just a thousand times more efficient. If I would be a bank, um, I would probably listen to that sentence more than once, uh, but there is, there is a real threat. Have I calculated all the use cases for all the industries? No, but to be honest, I don't think you would need to if you listen to these numbers. So, sorry for not having uh, uh, <laughs> easy yeah. how-to, but... Um, complex topic. Yeah. It's a super complex topic. It's a super complex that. topic, yes. And Bjorn, thank you so much for starting us off with the topic of ecosystems. We have the panel coming up now. Thank you so much and um, was a great... Business perspective on AI, thank you.